Good morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. Last week, we talked about ministry. We talked about work, making work the thing instead of what you're really working for. And I told you about ministry, how this happens in ministry. And I usually try to throw myself under the bus, so I told you what I did in the worship ministry. That's where I started out here because I had been a musician in my past. But if you know me, you know that I wasn't always a musician. I left that industry to do martial arts. I had done that my whole life, but it wasn't like your board breaking kind of martial arts. It was cage fighting. That's <laughs> what people called it in the beginning. In fact, it was illegal where I lived in New York. You couldn't have this type of competition. They had to kind of fight for that, the right to do that. So basically, two people got in a cage, and then one person got knocked out or gave up. <laughs> That's really what happened. So kind of dangerous. But here's the thing. When I describe my profession to people, like if I had to put it down on something or put it up on LinkedIn or whatever, I wouldn't put, like, martial arts instructor. I would put zookeeper. That's what I would put down. This kind of like that. You have these animals fighting in a cage all the time. These guys are crazy. Who wants to do that? So zookeeper, it would be on there. And now it's been said that the Lord prepares you. He uses your past to prepare you for your present. And indeed... Sometimes I really feel like a zookeeper here. <laughs> All right, yeah. So you got that ahead of time. That was good. You've had your coffee. Good stuff. So I heard a story about a real zookeeper who had zookeeper problems. There are zookeeper problems. And you can imagine, a lot of problems, a lot of animals there. So one day, he's going to open up the zoo. But one of the guys comes in, and he says, uh, we got a problem. What's that? The last of the gorillas has died. We don't have any gorillas today at the exhibit. Now, this is really important because kids love their animals. All kids have their favorite animal, right? So when you were a kid, you had your favorite animal. And if it's not at the zoo, your kid's going to lose their mind, right? So what? There are no gr So get a new guy, the zookeeper says. Get a new guy. So new guy comes in. Zookeeper says, here, put this on. And he presents him with a gorilla costume. And the guy's like, what am I going to do? Am I going to greet the kids when they come in in this costume? No, you're going to get in the gorilla exhibit. And the guy starts laughing. The zookeeper's not laughing. It's not a joke. You're either going to do it or go home. You're going to lose your job. Okay. So he puts the gorilla costume on. He gets in the exhibit. And at first he's kind of like, okay, it's hot. I can't see anything. What does a gorilla do? Should have watched the Discovery Channel a little more. So he's kind of like walking around trying to do, I'm not going to do gorilla moves. So he's walking around. <laughs> it could be pretty funny. But, you know, and so he's trying it out. And then he starts like getting into it. And after a while, he's really getting into it. Now, see, in the exhibit, they have all these like uh, rocks, like cliff faces and things. And a cave you can go cool off in, right? Because when you go to the zoo and you're a kid, like, where are the lions? Like, they're in the cave. It always seems like they were in the cave. They never came out. But anyway, he's not in there. He's just dancing around, dancing around. And he gets so into it, so excited, that he falls off one of these cliff faces. Now, it's not tall enough where he's going to get hurt real bad. But it is tall enough to keep other animals from coming into the gorilla exhibit, like the lions. Now he's found himself in the lion exhibit. He does himself off. He's not hurt. Can't see well, but can see well enough to notice that there's a lion there, about 30 feet or so away. So he starts thinking, okay, in a fight between a gorilla and a lion, who wins? <laughs> because it's going to be scared of me. So he stands there. The lion starts moving toward him, and he starts trying to be, like, subtle, right? Like, he's about to die, but, you know, i got to still, i got to keep my job. <laughs> so, you know, help, you know, a little help, help, help me. <laughs> like, you see, girl and lion not supposed to be together in the exhibit. It's not working, and it seems that the louder he asks for help, the faster the lion is coming toward him. So now he just panics. He just starts screaming. The lion charges right toward him then stops and says, hey, buddy, keep it down. You're going to get us both fired. <laughs> You're awake today. You got that one. Normally, like, there's, like, a lag. You know, if you got to think a little bit. It's like, <laughs> you got that. That makes me so happy. Thank you for laughing. 
All right, so last week, we're going to talk about taking off the mask. They're like, where is he going with this? That's what happens. All right, so we talked about not making the ministry the idol, not worshiping the work. And this came out of, we had Martha, Martha, right, the busy work, and then Mary, Jesus says she has all she needs right here. Cut it out, right? Not everyone has to do the busy work. The disciples, they go out, do all this great stuff. And he's like, no, no, no. no. Rejoice that your names are registered in heaven, not in the work. So that's where we were. We have been doing the Bible, if you're new here, chronologically-ish. It's really hard to do. In this case, where we are in the Bible, you have four gospel accounts. And sometimes they give us different perspectives or details. And so when you layer them together, you have to look at those different details, and I've been making you guys charts so that we could see where we are, and if you want to put them together, this is how I did it. Last week will be the same, this week will be the same as last week, where we're in Luke 10, we arrive Luke 11 through 13, and it's some unique stuff, some of the stuff we've already seen in the Sermon on the Mount, so what they're doing when they write these ancient Greco-Roman biographies is they're not looking necessarily put to put together like just a straightforward account. So just think of it like a show that kind of zooms in and out of time once in a while. So Luke's like, okay, I think this belongs here, and Jesus said that. Or you could have Jesus repeating himself, which good teachers do. He's the best teacher ever, so he's going to repeat himself when he needs to repeat things or things are important. So as we go through, if you're following along in your Bible, you're going to notice he's skipping stuff. That's because... It's somewhere else. We've already covered it. So I'm going to focus on things that point to our theme really well, and I'll just kind of mention some of the other stuff uh, as I go along. So here we have Jesus, again, criticizing the religious leaders. Luke 11, 37. As Jesus was speaking, one of the Pharisees invited him home for a meal. So he went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that he sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Then the Lord said to him, You Pharisees are, so, Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and wickedness. Fools! Didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you'll be clean all over. So now he starts leveling these criticisms. What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? You're careful to tithe the tiniest income from your herb gardens, but you ignore the bigger things, right? You should tithe, but you should be doing good as well. What sorrow awaits you Pharisees? For you love to sit in the places of honor, right? Get respectful greetings everywhere you go. What sorrow awaits you? For you are like hidden graves in a field. People walk over them without even knowing the corruption they're stepping on. Then one of the experts in religious law chimes in. You've insulted us by what you've said. Yes, what sorrow awaits you, experts in religious law. You crush people with these unbearable demands. So he just keeps criticizing them. He goes in a discourse that can be kind of confusing. We're not going to do it right now. If you want to discuss it at Bible study, I'll explain it to you. But he basically tells them, look, you built the monuments for these prophets, but you're responsible for their deaths, right? From everyone, from Abel all the way to Zechariah, like all the prophets, right? So he keeps criticizing them. What sorrow awaits you? You remove the key knowledge from people, but you don't enter the kingdom yourselves. You you prevent other ones from entering it. As he's leaving, they start coming up with all these ways that they can trap him with these questions. And so you see this a lot, right? So they want to get Jesus killed. They're done with him. But here's the point. You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy. This is our theme. You are like hidden graves, right? So imagine that. You don't know you're in a graveyard and it looks all beautiful like a golf course, but underneath they don't You don't understand what kind of corruption, what kind of death there is just beneath the surface. This is the point. So now, warnings on hypocrisy. Luke 12, 1. Meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. Jesus turned first to his disciples and warned them, Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and their hypocrisy. The time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed, and all that is secret will be made known to all. Whatever you've said in the dark will be heard in the light, and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. So here you run into a whole bunch of very similar teachings, some in the Sermon on the Mount and other places, 
Uh, but <clears throat> they're all under this light. Like he's making these massive criticisms. You have to just kind of imagine that. We, don't, uh, we could have a context like that. Like, so imagine there are a whole bunch of pastors in this room, and I'm saying that kind of stuff. You hypocrites, you're like hidden graves. And so he's not making any apologies for this. He's just going to town on them. So he goes into a sideline, right? Don't be afraid of those, because you might say, oh my gosh. And so my response would be, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body, and then they can't do any more to you like after that. Be afraid of God. He's the one to fear. He can kill you and then throw you into hell. So that's why he's teaching that. Some people kind of pull it out of context. He's saying this because, ah, I'm not afraid of these people, and you shouldn't be either. Fear God. Preach it. This is the truth. Okay? So then he goes into, what is the price of two, uh, five sparrows, two copper coins? Yet God doesn't forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are numbered. So don't be afraid. You're more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Right? So he's going to take care of you. He goes into the teaching we saw recently. Right? If you acknowledge me here, I'll acknowledge you before the angels, before God in heaven. So don't be ashamed of me. Again, under what? Context. He's going really hard. And he's saying, you shouldn't be ashamed either. Preach it. When you're brought to trial, and this kind of has a strange placement. This was in the Sermon on the Mount. When you're brought to trial in the synagogues <clears throat> before the rulers and the authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what to say, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what needs to be said. Sorry, I said it was in the Sermon on the Mount. It's not. <clears throat> um, but anyway, so don't worry about what you are to say. It's, the right thing is going to come out if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. All under this discourse here. We've gone over this story before, so he's going to go to wealth, and that makes a lot of sense in a second. Teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Friend, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And then he tells a story. A man had barns, and he filled them all up. He did really well. He filled up these barns. Uh-oh, what am I going to do? I have too much stuff. I know what I'll do. He has a conversation with himself. I'll tear down these barns and build bigger ones. Right? Then I can eat and relax. Look how well you've done. But then God says, you fool. Your soul, you're going to die this very night. Then who will get all your stuff? And Jesus says, friend. So yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, but not to have a rich relationship with God. It goes right into the theme that we looked at last week. Teaching on money and possessions, that's the one that's in the Sermon on the Mount. Be ready for the Lord's coming. So now he's going to go into a discourse, and all these are about being prepared. One of Jesus' favorite teachings is like the servant or the slave, right? So be ready like you're a servant in the master's household. He's going to go away. Don't like party right? or slack off or any, because he can come back at any time, right? And you can be punished. So just be a good steward of what you have. Jesus will cause division. He gives this warning as well. Before we saw, I have come to bring a sword. Not peace, but a sword. It wasn't about dishonoring your family. It wasn't about violence. Here, similar thing. I've come to set the world on fire. So he talks about the same type of thing. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, and mother-in-law against daughter-in-law. So he's going to start moving towards now the end times. Talking about being prepared goes with the sensible servant, again. Here again, <clears throat> in the Sermon on the Mount, when you go to court with your accuser, try to settle the matter before you get there. Otherwise, you might be found guilty, right? You'd be thrown into prison. And then a call to repentance, kind of a strange parable about a fig tree, but the point here is that someone owns <clears throat> this garden, plants a fig tree. It doesn't produce any fruit for three years. He wants to cut it down, but the gardener says, wait, give it another year. If it doesn't produce fruit, in a year, we'll cut it down. What's that about? Uh, you, you should repent. You're going to be given a little more time, maybe. But repent now. It's better off. So it goes per ties perfectly with the servants being ready for the master's return. Then, Luke 13, 10. One Sabbath day, as Jesus was teaching in a synagogue, he saw a woman who had been crippled by an evil spirit. She had been bent double for 18 years and was unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Dear woman, you are healed of your sickness. Then he touched her and instantly she could stand straight. How she praised God. But the leader in charge of the synagogue was indignant. 
that Jesus had healed her on the Sabbath day. There are six days of the week for working, he said to the crowd. Come on those days to be healed, not the Sabbath. But the Lord replied, you hypocrites, each of you works on the Sabbath day. Don't you untie your ox or your donkey from its stall on the Sabbath and lead it out for water? This dear woman, a daughter of Abraham, has been held in bondage by Satan for 18 years. Isn't it right? She'd be released even on the Sabbath? This shamed his enemies. But all the people rejoiced at the wonderful things he did. You hypocrites. Each of you works on the Sabbath day. Again, imposing religious demands to try to look better than they really are. You are so careful to clean the outside of the dish, but inside, filthy hypocrisy. Doing all these outward things, and it kind of ties into last week's theme, right? Doing all this work, but here's kind of the other part of it here. Why are you doing it, right? Well, to cover up what's on the inside sometimes. Hidden graves. There's this idea that what you're doing, like, on the back end over here doesn't match what you're presenting to everyone, what you're showing everyone. Hypocrisy, the definition, the practice of claiming to have moral standards of beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. Pretense. Now, when we think of these hypocrites in a biblical context, like, what might come to mind? Something like this might come to mind here, of this picture of a hypocrite, if we can put it up there. There we go. So that's a hypocrite, right? You can see right there. So he's like those Pharisees. Like, look what, so there's the giving jar, whatever it is. Look what I'm giving. Clink, right? So in biblical times, they would have these giving jars. Imagine like a trumpet. And the idea was like the more you put in there, the louder sound it would make. Right? So you're making sure to throw it in there. So everyone, look at me. And he's clearly all set. Right? Leftovers, I'm going to throw those in there. He's clearly doing all right. But the poor, is, the guy's right there. He's not concerned with helping the poor. He wants you to think that. He's concerned with himself and how he looks. That's the picture, right? So we look at a biblical Pharisee or hypocrite like that. That's it. Now, here's the thing. This is going to get really dicey, but... It's going to be okay. We'll all make it. <laughs> so to a pastor, from what I see, see, people tell pastors stuff, right? So that's a big part of the job. When I think <laughs> of a hypocrite, something totally different comes to mind. This is what comes to mind. Now, some of you are like, oh, he's finally lost his mind. It's happened. We're here to witness it. I knew it was going to happen. <laughs> but, but let me explain. So this, this, is, this is a very chancy thing to do. So first of all, uh, I don't think, I, I was thinking about it. I'm like, what if I put this picture up that I stole off the Internet, but I left the little stock, you know, photo stock thing over there. It's got the watermark, so they're fine. Relax. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, but what if this actual family came in? <laughs> I feel like, so if that's you, I can't see the balcony, too many lights. But if that's you, right, sorry, not sorry, right? So it, it's God. Like, so maybe I'm going to start talking about some of the things that are wrong with you. So remember this. This is not every family. So when I, when I go through this thing, I want you to just hear this first. Disclaimer. Listen, <laughs> I'm not saying this is every family who does a photo like this. Okay? Did you hear that? Not every family. But... As a pastor, I'm going to give you some hyperbole here, like big word, right? Like overthrow. I'm going to be big overthrow. But, but if I had to like think about like, like all the couples that come into my office, all the families that come into my office, right? And think about it for a minute. Now I'm going to give you like worst case scenario what I see. And then there's like some smaller stuff. It's like about 80%, 90% of, of, of families that like are presenting well, right? So, so here's just like how I know that this is a fake picture. Watermark. It's got the watermark. So obviously, right, nobody watermarks that. If you did that, I'd be like, okay, we really need to talk on your Facebook page or Instagram, right? But he, here's how I know it's fake. Because first of all, the bubbles. This is the first thing. The bubbles is the first thing that I want to talk about, all right? Look, I don't know. Maybe you do. But... 
I don't go on any picnics, but if I went on a picnic, like, bubbles wouldn't be the first thing on the packing list. And now for you, you're like, it would be for me. Well, uh, you're five? Like, so what, <laughs> but bubbles, like, you know, I, you know, bubbles, what do we need bubbles for? Right, you know, meat, right, that's what, <laughs> meat, a blanket, like, think about your packing list, really, guys, bubbles. And so that's, like, kind of the important thing about this photograph. Here's a few other problems. Yeah, so, so. That's not what happens with bubbles. I had a kid, I still have a kid, but she doesn't do the bubbles anymore. But when kids get bubbles, they do not sit down. That's not happening. Kid gets the bubble wand, right? And what do they do? Woo! And they run around with the bubbles and they're doing all this stuff, right? And what happens? They fall off a cliff like the guy in the gorilla costume. They hit a tree, right? So if this was really at the stage where the kid would be sitting down, they would already have a Band-Aid. They went to the boo box because that's what you, you, you pack, and you put the Band-Aid on. So the kid would be crying. The eyes would be all red. That's what's happening. You're not getting a kid to sit down. Okay, other problem with the bubbles. They get all over the food. Who unpacks all the food like that, leaves a watermelon open, no saran wrap that is visible to my eye at all, and you're going to start blowing bubbles all over it. Are you kidding me? Right? So the food's gone first. I take out the food. I don't see too much good meat. So that's the other problem there. You know, but the bubbles are going to... Then you have bugs. There's the issue of bugs. Watermelon on the ground like that? Are you kidding? The ants are going to be all in there. And then there's the kind of like, you ever get bit by a fire ant? That's a problem. So this whole thing... And then they're in a field. Where are they? That's a big space. You could get lost out there. So anyway... The other reason I know this is not real, this is, this is it. If that was real, you could put that back up. We, we, I'm not done with that family yet. <laughs> My wife's on the slide, so I have to be super careful today. <laughs> like, really, this could go bad for me. Like, that's the least of my worries. That's the most of my <laughs> worries right there. Right? So anyway, here's the thing. Here's the number one indicator that that is not a real photograph. Nobody is on their phone. That's not real, right? Everybody, even the kid. The kid would have headphones on and be on top. They don't, they don't care about bubbles anymore. They got all, everything right here. They're like <laughs> popping the bubbles on their phone. They'd be on the phone, right? So that's not real. People don't laugh and talk to one another and have fun together. We do it together on our phones. This is what they want you to see. Again, this is not all families, but I'm just kind of making a big thing here so you get the point. Not all families, but from the pastor's desk, that ain't what's happening when they go on a picnic, if they do. That's a photo shoot, okay? It's not a picnic. No way, all right? So, now, here's what's going on. I want you to, like, absorb the photograph and think about that. Now, now I'm going to give you worst, worst case scenario, okay? So, this is not this family, okay? It is an example, but I've seen people that present like this. So I'm, I'm going to give you a wild example. So just, just pretend. It's a pretend family. Again, I'm going to say that again. <laughs> so it's a pretend family. But I have families that present like this. And that's what they do. This is all they're going to put on the social media. That's it. Right? That's it. This is all they're going to let you in on. The bubbles. The nice times. Right? I've pastored families like this. But on the back end, this is what's happening. And this is not you, not everybody. But I've pastored families like this. On the back end, it doesn't look like that. On the back end, the woman, this is several scenarios, she's depressed. She's depressed. Cries in the closet. Hates the way she looks. Husband doesn't pay attention to her anymore. She's all upset. Doesn't feel like she can get anything right. Gets to middle age or whatever. I don't like the way I look anymore. My husband doesn't love me. Some of these women develop a drinking problem. I've seen that, experienced that. And so that's a mess. She's a mess. The husband, oh, yeah, he's on his phone. Used to be the Bible, but now it's not. That honeymoon is over. Now he's looking at all kinds of things he shouldn't be looking at on his phone. What are you doing, honey? Oh, I'm just reading my Bible again. Not talking to God. You're talking to another woman that's who he's talking to, flirting with the idea. Maybe there's something a little better than this old lady out there who drinks too much. But that's what they're showing you. The kid, headphones on, totally tuned out. But the kid hears everything, 
everything. Everything. But you know what they say just in case? Don't tell anyone what we do at home. That happens. So I'll be seeing that kid in a few years. Doesn't even know if they want to have a family ever. It's a mess. But here's what's going on. It's not just, it's not just the family picture that they're putting out there. It's, it's not just these things. The, the problem is that they will come to church. And the guy will lead like life groups and Bible studies and things like that. And start telling everybody else how to live their life. When his is a total mess. Hypocrite. That's why. Now, I'm done with the family now. <laughs> I'll go to mine. Now you're like, we're so serious. All right. I'll go to mine. So this is, and this is funny. You know, my wife's like, right, do we really have to show this picture of me? Yes, we do. There we go. This is what happens when you're, oh, but let me explain. Oh, that's going to go away really quick. So first thing, yes, this looks terrible because, I don't know, it got stuck to the frame. Like I was inside a glass frame, so this is like I took a picture of it. Right? So, but I felt like, as I was, this is just funny, this has nothing to do with anyone but me. So I, I, I'm taking the, the, this is my life, taking the picture out, and I think it's going to rip because it's stuck right where I am. So it's stuck on me, right? And I started thinking, like, if I, I get ripped out of the picture, will I disappear? What movie is that from? <laughs> right? So I was like, oh, I'm going to leave it in the glass, right? So we'll just be careful. That's what really went through my mind. That's what happens. Yeah. So, okay, let me explain something. So, so how do you know this isn't real, right? A, we're sitting down. Who says, let's get dressed up in our nice clothes and sit on the floor? Nobody. That's the first thing your parents tell you. You get dressed up for church or whatever. They're like, get off the floor, right? So that, we broke rule number one, right? Second thing. If you have a dog, you know what's wrong with this. Now, dogs can be very difficult when you're trying to take a picture of them. They never look at the camera. You need a treat. And we could have done that. But there's another reason why the dog would be looking away from the cameraman in particular. Because she's done something wrong. That's what dogs do. If you don't have a dog, they do this. They won't look at you, but they'll like kind of check without turning their head. They do that. That's what a dog does, and that's what she's doing. So they'll, like, look away, like, what did you do? And they, but they'll, like, check with their eyeball. They don't move the head. This dog is doing that because, oh, she's so cute. Right, that's exactly what the photographer thought when the dog came in. The dog's reaction to that was to poop all over the photography studio. <laughs> so this perfect family, that is exactly what happened immediately when they walk in. We bring our dog to the photo shoot. Like, why? It's part of the family. So we got to bring the dog. So that's a mess right there. I'm done picking on my daughter, so I won't do that to her any, at all. So anymore. Well, not ever, but just today. So, <laughs> so let's just talk about the people in that picture. So this guy, yes, that is a leather, leather elbow thing. That's fancy, right? So, and if you, I don't know if you can see the shoes, but I'm literally wearing the same shoes. This is old. If you know my family, this is actually an old photograph. My daughter is like that tall now. So we have her on a highly caffeinated diet to try to slow that down a little bit. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's her. This is old. This is a really old picture. I'm wearing the same shoes. So you can have nice things, yes, and, you know, if you buy cheap, you buy twice. But anyway, I didn't have to buy another pair of black dress shoes. Isn't that amazing? It's been like 8 million years. So that's like the only good thing about the photograph. <laughs> anyway, but this guy, you know, he looks like he's got it together, right? Nope. Nope. Not on the inside. Those of you who know my story. Right? So I didn't have a good relationship with my dad, and I didn't do good in school. Not at all. The Holy Spirit allowed me to read, but before the Holy Spirit, I was really bad. I had kind of like dyslexia, just to make a long story short. So I never good in school. My dad could not accept that. That was not the right answer. You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid. All right? You're lazy. You're skinny. You're weak. So what did this guy do? This guy decided to quit what he was good at, music. I am going to do martial arts. I'm going to do all kinds of crazy. I'm going to beat people up. And if my dad or anybody like him ever calls me that again, I'm going to kill him. All right? So that was what was going on all of the time. I'm going to lift as much weight as humanly possible and do steroids. And I'm going to get as big as I possibly can. If my dad ever says that to me again, I'm going to kill him, right? So that's what's going on. So we got all the, and that's it, all the time, fighting, lifting weights, eating, just 
craziness. Then I'm stupid? Oh, really? Oh, really? I'm going to make more money than anybody in my graduating class. Check. And even after that check mark was there, it was not enough because nothing is ever enough for that guy. Nothing. Not that beautiful family, nothing, nothing. I'm going to be bigger, richer, better, beautiful Italian sports car in the driveway, does not matter. Drive it out of the lot already looking at the next one I'm going to buy. Oh, I don't have a Harvard ring. I have a $20,000 watch. Keep up with that. That's what that guy is thinking about right there. Not thinking about anything that's actually going on around me because nothing is ever enough. You've heard Heather's story. That woman is white knuckling it probably at this time and on her way to a very serious drinking problem. <laughs> We're, this, these are two people living to prove everyone wrong. That's it. No real, like, joy. No enjoying that moment. There's, no. It's not happening. You're looking at a couple who is exhausted. Exhausted. Just tired and depressed. Exhausted. They look happy, but inside, these people are really sad. Really sad. But they're doing everything possible to make you believe otherwise. Everything. Let's go back to that definition again. Hypocrisy. The practice of claiming to have moral standards of beliefs to which one's own behavior does not conform. Pretense. And one word, pretense. Let's look at that definition. Pretense, an attempt to make something that is not the case appear true. Let's go back to that picture. I know it's, this is going to cause like a, an argument later, but we, we can do it. Come on. There we go. Now, we don't often think of this as hypocrisy, right? But I'm going to tell you. I don't know about the other family, but I was just trying to make a point. I know this family. There is an amazing amount of pretense going on there. An amazing amount of pretense. We normally think of it, right? Hypocrite. Someone trying to be better than or this and that, but you don't think of it in our everyday lives and how we might be doing it. This is us pretending to be better than we really are. So if we, we feel, we look, everything looks better than it really is. But it's not. Yet we're keeping it up. We're trying to prove that we're better than others. And there was no end to it. We already beat, we clobbered the Joneses. Not even close. I drive around in my car for where we lived. You knew where we lived in New York? <laughs> I should drive this car around. I'm not going to say the brand, but you drive a car on, and people would say to me, are you lost? Are you lost? Like, you don't see them. People take pictures and stuff, sit on it. It was a real pain in the neck. Anyway. <laughs> not just, uh, are you lost? But it, was, it still wasn't enough. I want the better one. And that's all I thought about. I had, like, vision boards, you know. Like, right? So I'd get this watch. And think, well, are their watches more expensive? Yep. They'd be up, I'd have pictures of them up there, obsessed. But why? You're wrong. What you said was wrong about me. Wrong. This is all we were putting out there about ourselves. That's it. It's all anybody knew. Even if it wasn't true. But, you see, this is social media them. This is Sunday them. This is not real them. And it's not how they got here on Sunday. It's not how we got here on Sunday. How we get here on Sunday? Well, that started Saturday night. We were drinking heavily. Heavily. And then 
get in a stupid argument. I don't even know what we would argue about. It was just stupid. And somebody say something, and then you're going to remind that person, right, that you say you love about something they did, like, years ago. Like, get over it. No. That's going to come up. And then we're going to have an argument. We're going to stay up too late arguing. We're not going to stop. Just go to sleep. We're going to argue, argue, argue. And we'll get up in the morning. Now we're hungover and we're tired for church. That's why we pick, I told you this, which Heather told you this. We picked the one with an 11 a.m. service. <laughs> and that was the stated reason. That's why. That's why. We're hungover, so i got to nurse this. I'm going to come in, right, get the kid ready. Or she was pretty good. But she's been exposed. Don't tell anyone. She's been exposed to all that. We fight again. Don't talk to each other. It's a mess. Maybe we're saying things in the car. Definitely a lot of bad words. I've been all the way there. Right? And I slip. It's okay. But we're not slipping. <laughs> we're sliding. We're, we are just going at it. Right? It's a mess. A mess. We walk in the church door. Hey, we're fine. <laughs> Everything's great. That's it. It's like a switch. Look at us. We're perfect. Perfect. Look at social media. That's Christmas card them. That's it. Now, there is nothing wrong. Hear this. Nothing wrong with getting dressed up for church. There's nothing wrong with being presentable or that's fine. Having self-respect. That's not what I'm talking about. There is something wrong when the pretense is all you practice in front of others. That's when there's something wrong. It's all a cover-up, and it's exhausting. And people get incredibly elaborate, incredibly elaborate with these things. You can switch if you want. There you go. <laughs> incredibly elaborate. Like, I see people out there, like, pre they, they come up with a, another version. So that's the perfect. But they're like, oh, wait a minute. Someone might not believe this. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up with a less than perfect version of me and put that out there. <laughs> it's just so manipulative, right? Like, like, ooh, maybe they went out and had no makeup on or something. And I'm not just picking on the ladies, but, you know, anyway. <laughs> no makeup on. You know, they go out, they get some good sun, like, hey, I don't look too bad today. This is a great time to take, like, fake no filter pick, like the fake real pick, the fake no makeup pick. Right? And then it's like disgusting when like the supermodel women do it, right? Like this is me with no makeup. It's like better than like anyone will ever look ever, right? And so, but it's just this manipulated false modesty manipulation. There are like several other thems out there. Pretense. But here's the thing. We all do this at a base level, and I, I told you this before, because of insecurity. It's insecurity. That's what it is. Fear of rejection, insecurity. That's it. And I get it. So if anybody out there or whatever out there is, I get it. But here's the thing. And we see this awful lot. This, this is like huge, huge in the fitness industry. Huge, huge. <laughs> By the time I was like getting ready to retire and I'd been in church for a little while, <laughs> I would go through the gym and I'd see these guys. I was much bigger than I am now. But <laughs> I'd see these guys that have like cannonballs for shoulders, right? You know, they're just not going to stop. You know, they're very angry. And I'd come up to them and I'd be like, it's okay, you can stop now. Jesus loves you. Right? You know what I mean? But that's what I began to see. The Holy Spirit gave me that ability. I didn't see these big intimidating guys anymore. I'm like, I saw babies. A bunch of big babies. You're just scared. You're afraid of something being rejected, overcompensating. It's like, enough already. You have a heart attack. And one of my best students, actually, one of these animals, just, he jacked guy. He's about, and, and this is going to scare some people, but whatever, it's the fitness industry. He's probably with 250 pounds of muscle. <laughs> Impressive. But he got a bad rate on his insurance because he was technically morbidly obese for his height. Your heart doesn't know the difference. You're going to kill yourself. That's what you're going to do. Kill yourself. You're so in shape, you're out of shape. But that's what these crazy people are doing to themselves. And if you're Jack, yeah, I called you a crazy person. We'll talk about it later. <laughs> but think about it for a second. Like, there's being in shape. I get it. 
But then there's like taking it a little bit too far. Like this is, come on, we get it. Insecurities at a base level, it's just insecurities, and I get it. But here's the thing, and I'm not saying like you, but to phrase it, it's not all about them. It's not all about you. That's the first part. The second part is the problem with this is not just for themselves, but for others as well. Now, we'll put it in a church context. We've talked about the country club culture. It creates this thing. Like if someone actually, and there were people who actually believed that about us. They believed that like that was us. And so what happens when that comes into the church, right? And we're never sharing. We're never revealing anything else about us. What does everyone else think? Whoa, I got to be like that. You know, if they have a problem, they're going to open. They're like, oh, I might get kicked out of this place if I open up about that problem. That's great. It's so funny. People will tell me, like, if you know my story, like, they'll make you laugh. But, like, oh, man, no, 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 I can't come to church. You, ha you have no idea, Pastor. I'm like, <laughs> first of all, yes, I do. <laughs> like, you wouldn't understand. I'm like, really? Like, you have no I was in a rock band in the 80s and 90s. I've seen everything, right? So it just makes, anyway, so, never mind. So, but that's what it does, though. When everybody comes in, they're like, and this is not that kind of church. i got to applaud you guys for that. Not that kind of church. But, you know, it's a lot of churches we've been to, right? Everybody's dressed up perfect. And it's not, again, it's not bad to dress up. But that's it. It's a, it's a country club in there. If you, I, you know, and it, <laughs> back in the day, we had a traditional service, and we've changed very much. As a I got yelled at for wearing dungarees in church. Like, What? Dunger, what's a dungaree? And that's, if you're old, you know what that means, right? So I'm not mining for gold in these Levi's, right? So they're called jeans, old man. But anyway, <laughs> but I got yelled at. So what happens, and this happens, right? Where's your tie, whatever it is. And so when we build it up that big, what happens when someone has a problem? They're like, if that was the problem, what is going to happen to me if I tell them, like, my real problem? Forget it. Now you've got a country club. That's it. Everyone is being fake. You only know the person that they've presented. That's it. Nobody really like knows anybody. And I've been a part of a church like that. It's weird. Really weird. So it brings me to this. A bad word. <laughs> I'm going to say a bad word in church. Confession. Right, so we don't like that word. That's a, a <laughs> right now. I'm not talking about. So I was raised Catholic. I'm not talking about that kind of confession. Oh, that would be really cool if we could make like a confessional booth and like you knew it was me in there, but I'd sit there in the dark anyway, and I knew exactly who it was. Right? <laughs> like I don't know your voice, and they come in there like. Anyway, just think it would be hilarious. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about more of a personal type of thing, right? Where you're being open with others about what you're going through, but it's biblical. James 5.16, confess your sins to each other. It doesn't say the priest, right? Confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. It accomplishes much. You won't be healed until you confess the problem. Right? So it's like going to a doctor. He gives you a diagnosis, and you're like, nope. You can't get healed. You're not going to go through the treatment. I don't have that. I'm not going to take a treatment. Okay. But that's what it is. It's just a denial. Like, nope. You will not be healed unless you acknowledge that you have a problem. That's the first thing. Here's the other thing where the church comes into play. Also, and you know that you are not a problem. Because you ha hear this, because you have that problem does not mean you are a problem. You are not. Keep reading. James 5.19, my dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Keep reading. Well, Go back. <laughs> Galatians 6.1. Dear brothers and sisters, if another believer is overcome by some sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back onto the right path. And be careful not to fall into the same temptation yourself. 
share each other's burdens, and in this way, obey the law of Christ. If you think you are too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You're not that important. That's the attitude at a real church. The secret you're carrying can be a heavy burden. It can be exhausting. Imagine being, that's what it's called, be free of sin, just be freed from all that. I can tell you in my own story, I mess up. I mess up all the time. But to be freed from like that hamster wheel, oh, wow. It's amazing. I think so differently now about everything. You don't have to be that exhausted. We can help with that burden here because that's what it is. When you hide your issues, you actually deprive a real Christian of an opportunity. Galatians 6, 9. So let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. To a real church, your burden is an opportunity for me. That's what it is. As I kind of wrap things up here, I just, I do want to say this. It's a very sad thing <clears throat> when someone goes through something and they've kept it to themselves. Right? They did a good job. We are masters of hiding all this stuff. A really good job of keeping. But there's a point at which, like the fig tree, We'll give it another year, but it's too late. There's a point at which it's too late. It's too late. And everybody says the same thing. But she looked like she had it all together. But he looked like he had it all together. He looked like he didn't have any problems at all. And I watch from the pastors as the emotions people process, the responsibility that now you've taken that burden. Not, you, you get what I'm saying? Taking that burden, and you've given it to them and checked out. Good for you. But you've left wreckage, burdens upon burdens if you do that. It's the worst thing. And so this is what Jesus is telling you. You know, okay, but there's a too late. Come back in a year. There's going to be a too late. So it's better to just give your family the opportunity to help you. If that's you. And there's bad thinking there, too. On the other end of things, someone was, this happens a lot in Naples. People will come in and be like, oh, these rich people. And I'm like, well, you're in Naples, right? So uh, I don't know what, where you think you moved. <laughs> but look around you. You can't be angry. Well, you can, then you're always going to be angry if you're angry at rich people, right? But people have come up to me, and I correct them. Well, they're rich, so they can't have any problems. Well, you see that photo? <laughs> Here in Naples, we were not rich. We were poor. <laughs> but where we lived, we were rich, right? We had a lot of problems. It's really bad, hateful thinking. And so what I tell people is, you know what? Those rich people are the sickest people right now in the room. I know. The sickest people out there. Blessed are the poor. That's what Jesus says. Read James. It'll change the way you think, hopefully. So the question is, if there's something weighing you down, what is it? What is it? What's weighing you down? And just pray about bringing it to someone. So how we do things here, if you don't know. <laughs> so whatever you tell me, I don't even tell my wife. We don't do that. It stays with me and Jesus. So if you want, that's why we do the food upstairs. And we told about that. We eat together. We try to bounce around to as many of the tables as possible. You don't even have to do that. You're going to be told how you can connect with us on the app, the connection card. If you want me to give you a call, you want a meeting, we can try to schedule that. Great. And you can tell me. But I'm not the only person in the church. So usually what I do is I start thinking through my Rolodex, that's an old word, <laughs> of people that might be able to help you too and keep confidence as well. We do the buddy system here. We don't do the big groups where you can get lost and hide and stuff like that. No, two by two. That's how Jesus sends them, right? That's it. 
get together with somebody and share. Share. Right? They'll let you in, you let them in. That's how it works. It's very, very simple. There's no program for that. It's called family. It's called friendship. So just to let you know, that's practically like what we do here. And so if it's your first time, welcome to real church <laughs> for real people. It's okay. This is a place where we love one another. We share one another's burdens. And in this way, fulfill the law of Christ. Amen? Let me pray. Lord, I thank you for this time. Everyone who can hear my voice right now, Lord, where conviction needs to happen, let it happen. I hope you use me, Lord, during this time to bring healing ultimately to people, to let them know the door is open. They can come here for help. Lord, for those of us who are just a little further ahead, just keep filling us with your Holy Spirit. Let us be those vehicles of your grace, your mercy, your forgiveness, your peace, and your love to everyone we encounter this week. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.